next video, we will discuss aspects of membrane transport and mechanisms for transporting molecules across the membrane. All right, so what you see on the screen is a picture that I want you to consider. Imagine that the blue cell in the middle of the screen has both dissolved solute on the inside of the cell and on the outside of the cell. As you can see from the picture, there is more dissolved solute on the inside of the cell compared to the outside of the cell. Given what you see, can you make a prediction as to the direction that those dissolved solute particles will move? In other words, will they move out of the cell or will they move into the cell? Similarly, can you make a prediction as to uh, which direction water will move? Will it move into the cell or out of the cell? Uh, pause the video and take a moment to make your predictions and be sure to write them down on a whiteboard or in your journal. So what would you come up with? Hopefully, you came up with the idea that the particles, the red particles, will move out of the cell, while water will move into the cell. The purpose of this lesson is to help you understand why these events are taking place. So first, in order to understand um, why those molecules are moving the way that they were, it's important to understand what types of molecules can and cannot cross the membrane. If you remember from the previous video, the internal portion of the membrane is hydrophobic due to those fatty acid tails, and consequently, molecules that are polar will not be able to cross the membrane easily. Remember, polar does not like nonpolar. Nonpolar molecules will, however, be able to cross the membrane readily because nonpolar does like nonpolar. So in general, polar molecules cannot cross the membrane. Nonpolar molecules will be able to cross the membrane. Large polar molecules, like proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, will not be able to cross the membrane by themselves. Ions, same deal. They won't be able to cross the membrane because they won't be able to interact with the nonpolar interior of that cell membrane. Now, water is kind of peculiar. Water is definitely a polar molecule, but as you can see here in the picture, water is crossing the membrane. It's important to note that while water can cross the membrane, even though it's polar, it does so very, very slowly because it has to cross through the nonpolar barrier. And we'll explain why molecules like water can cross the membrane, albeit very, very slowly, in a couple of slides. So it turns out that one of the reasons why water can cross the membrane is because the membrane is fluid. If you think back to the animation that you saw as part of the previous video, where all the phospholipid molecules were dancing around, and I, enc I encourage you to go back and look at that video if you need to, there are going to be moments where those phospholipids bump into each other, bounce off one another, and create small gaps in between the molecules. Well, those are the moments where water molecules can cross the membrane. But of course, in order to do that, it's going to have to be small enough, which water is, and not so polar that it can't at least partially dissolve in the nonpolar portion of the cell membrane. But in reality, it doesn't really have to dissolve at all. It just has to make its way through the gaps that exist in those phospholipids as they bounce off one another. So the permeability of the membrane will ultimately be influenced by uh, the fluidity of the membrane. And there are some factors that I want you to consider when you consider the fluidity of the membrane. Not surprisingly, unsaturated fatty acids are going to make phospholipids more unsaturated and more fluid because the phospholipids will not be able to pack tightly together. So if there's more unsaturated fatty acid chains and phospholipids, the fluidity is expected to increase. Temperature is also an important factor that will in influence uh, membrane fluidity. If temperature goes up, fluidity goes up. Why? Well, because molecules have more kinetic energy at higher temperatures. They're going to be moving around faster. They're going to be bumping into each other more often. That's going to allow those gaps to form and allow molecules like water to move across the membrane freely. Cholesterol is a third factor that's going to influence membrane fluidity. And in this case, if we think about cholesterol as getting in between the gaps that exist between the phospholipids, now we're making it even harder for molecules to get across, especially those that are polar. So molecules like cholesterol make the molecule, sorry, make the membrane less fluid, more rigid, and thus less permeable to different solute particles. So if the membrane is selectively permeable, we want to appreciate the types of molecules that can and cannot cross the membrane. Hopefully you remember what makes molecules polar, but let's quickly review why water is a classic example of a polar molecule. Because of the unequal distribution of charge, we know that there are more electrons, uh, or electrons spend more time closer to the oxygen atom than they do to either of the hydrogen atoms. So there's a net uh, distribution of charge across the water molecule, so that oxygen has a slight negative charge, 
the hydrogen has a slight positive charge, and that separation of charge makes the molecule polar. So if you can look at a molecule and predict that it's polar, as I'm hoping you can do by now, you're beginning to get a sense of which molecules can and cannot cross the membrane freely. Remember, polar molecules really can't cross at all, nonpolar molecules can. Water is kind of the exception. Because it's so small, even though it's polar, it can find its way between the gaps that exist within the phospholipids. Well, what, what, what are some other molecules that we know cannot cross the membrane? Well, any charged molecule is not going to be able to cross the membrane. Ions, while they're not molecules, they're certainly charged, they're not going to be able to cross the membrane either. Okay? So any charged particle, any polar molecule, especially if it's large, will not be able to cross the membrane. So these are all your nucleotides, your amino acids, your carbohydrates, your nucleic acids. All of those molecules will be unable to cross the membrane, at least by themselves. What sorts of molecules can cross the membrane? Well, anything that's nonpolar. So lipids cross the membrane freely. Small molecules, uncharged molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, uh, ethanol, those molecules have uh, the ability to cross the membrane as well. So you might be asking yourself at this point, there sure are quite a few molecules that can't cross the membrane, but they also seem that they're important in terms of keeping the cell alive. Certainly, carbohydrates are, are important. Glucose is important as a molecule that cells need in order to perform respiration. So how do those molecules get across the membrane? Well, they're going to need help. And they're going to get that help in the form of transport proteins. So if you remember your model of the membrane from the other day, those red straws that hopefully you placed in between the phospholipid molecules, those red straws could represent transport proteins. And those transport proteins are the molecules that are responsible for moving molecules that can typically not cross the membrane from one side of the membrane to the other. So let's take a moment and think about how these transport proteins might work. Transport proteins are going to be up on the membrane, and their job will be to move particles that typically cannot cross the membrane on their own uh, across the membrane. So thinking about the molecules that you just saw, or maybe an ion that you just saw, choose one of them that you know is going to be unable to cross the membrane. Next, see if you can come up with the structure of a protein that you think would transport this particle. What would it look like? Which characteristics would it need to have? And then finally, can you propose a mechanism that could be used to explain how this particle crosses the membrane? So take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can answer these questions. And when you're finished, we'll watch an animation that I think will begin to hopefully answer the question for you. Okay, so let's take a look at the video, or sorry, the animation that will answer the question. Uh, Okay, so the animation that you see here on the screen is going to be an example of a transport protein moving these orange particles from one side of the membrane to the other. So here are the particles, here's the outside of the cell, here's the inside of the cell. Well, how does this protein work? Well, clearly there's going to have to be some spot on the protein where the solute particle, or the particle that has to be transported, is going to bind. And we can see that here. This would be analogous to the active site of an enzyme where the substrate is going to bind to the enzyme. In this case, we're not really dealing with an enzyme. We're dealing with a solute particle that's going to have to bind to the protein and then be, be transported across the membrane. So what does this look like? Well, as we can see, the particles are moving randomly in the cell. And the goal, if you will, is for that particle to get from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So it has to bind to the protein. The shape of the protein is going to change, just like what we see in an enzyme. And the shape change will facilitate the movement of that particle from one side of the membrane to the other. As soon as one particle binds, another one can bind, the shape of the protein can change, and that particle can move across the membrane. just like that. So if we can begin to appreciate these particles and the fact that they are moving across the membrane either by themselves or with the assistance of various transport proteins, 
we want to begin to ask ourselves why the particles are moving at all. Well, particles move because of diffusion. And diffusion in general is the movement of particles from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. And you've all experienced this. If your mom or dad bring home a pizza and the pizza's over in the kitchen, I'd be willing to bet that at some point you can smell the pizza up in your bedroom or maybe where you're watching television because the odor molecules of the pizza are diffusing from the pizza box through your house, through the air, to where you're located. So we've all experienced diffusion. But how does it work? Well, remember that all molecules are in constant motion and they're bumping into each other. If there are more molecules that are close to one another, it'd be expected that the number of collisions, the frequency of collisions, would be higher when the molecules are packed tightly together compared to when they're spread out. So collisions, the number of collisions would be much higher when molecules are highly concentrated. Well, if the molecules are bumping into each other more often when they're in close proximity to one another, we would expect that over time, those molecules would spread out into empty space. And over the course of time, ultimately, all of the molecules that are present in that space will be evenly distributed because the number of collisions will eventually have reached a point where the molecules have evenly spread out in whatever container, whatever room, whatever environment they happen to be in. So diffusion looks a lot like this. In this example, we have some molecules of dye that are on one side of this container. The molecules are dissolved in dye, sorry, dissolved in water. Here's water on the other side of the membrane. Because of the collisions that are taking place between the molecules of dye, eventually they're going to bump into one another and spread out into the empty space. And we can see that happening over here. If we give, it, we give this process enough time, there will be enough collisions on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this barrier so that the number of molecules on both sides of the membrane will be equal. And when that happens, we've reached equilibrium, where the concentration of particles is the same on both sides of the membrane. Well, in order to really understand the difference between um, what's happening in that, uh, on that previous slide, we want to begin to appreciate what happens during 